Welcome to Home Group. My name is Rick Renner. And tonight we're going to be continuing our study of the book of Revelation. And we're looking at what Christ had to say to the church of Smyrna. Last week we just barely got started. And it was really good, wasn't it, Denise? That was pretty amazing. It was pretty amazing. And we, we saw that the things that we're seeing happen today are, are not anything new. And that that spirit manipulating people in the earth was the same spirit that was manipulating people how many years ago? 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Hi, Joe. We're glad you're here tonight. It's good to be here. I'm really enjoying it. I just love to hear about Polycarp, Bishop Polycarp. Oh, it was awesome, wasn't it, Joe? Yes, it was. And how he said at 86 years old, God has not forsaken me. Not one time, and I will not forsake him. Yes, I will not blaspheme his name. I am a Christian. Mm -hmm. That was just so good last time. I love that. You can almost sense his heart. And he was the bishop of the church of Smyrna, the area of Smyrna, that worshipped an evil, evil god. And the city looked like, uh, looked like the goddess, and her name was Sybil. 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 But what, what if people weren't here with us last week? Then they have to go to the archives. But I'm going to tell you, you need to go to the archives because you do not want to miss what we talked about last week. It is the foundation for these verses. And these verses are Revelation chapter 2, 8 to 11. Now that doesn't sound like very many verses. One, two, three, four verses. But there's a lot packed into these verses. And I want you to see the archive from last week if, if you, if you missed, can. missed mm -hmm. our home group. And if you can do it, you need to go back and review because it's really powerful. And stay with us tonight to the end because we're going to cover some really important things tonight. I think you're going to really enjoy it. And if you have a prayer request, let us know. We would love to pray for you. Our prayer team is a powerful prayer team, and they will pray for you, and they get results. And Denise and I and Joel want to ask you to go to the chat, identify yourself, tell us where you're from, Tell us what you're getting out of the home group. It would really mean a lot to us because we're putting a lot into this. I'm teaching from my book, A Light in Darkness. And you know, I've been waiting to teach on this for a long time. And I just suddenly got inspired that it's time to do it. And if you don't have a copy of A Light in Darkness, you can order it at renner.org. Just go to renner.org and you can place your order for your copy of this book. And volume two is also there which is also a light and darkness, volume two, no room for compromise. This is really a work of art. Thank these, you. These books are just a collection. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we're, we've, we've, we're working on publishing the Russian version. We are. Uh-huh. A Russian version of uh, volume one. And we're working on all the photos, getting all the rights for the photos, purchasing the rights, so that we can publish it exactly the same in Russian. And, and working with, with your designer, it's just amazing to see how much work went into purchasing, looking for, and making the book correct, showing the photos to explain oh. the text. Oh. A lot of work went a into lot these, of work. a lot of work went into these books. A lot of work. It's it's years and years and years of education in both books. Just kudos to your whole team for doing this. It's, Thank you. But Rick, it is it is a treasure. It is a treasure to have. And, and uh, so if you have yours, go get it, because we're going to be reading out of it tonight. Tonight we're going to begin on page 408, where we're reading the scripture in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 to 11. And verse 8 says, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write. Well, let's stop right there. Okay. Who is the angel? Polycarp. Polycarp. Polycarp was the angel. He was the pastor. He was the bishop of the church in Smyrna. And what have we learned about the city of Smyrna? They worshiped the goddess uh, Sybil, who was the offspring of Zeus, who when was born had... Oh, don't go into all those details. It's just gross. It's just gross. gross it's gross, sexually gross. perverted. It's just gross in every way. The entire city was devoted to the worship of this very grotesque When it was rebuilt, goddess. when the city of uh, Smyrna was rebuilt, it was structured to look from the sea like the goddess Sybil. That is exactly right. And the whole city was dominated by this worship. And there was a Jewish community in Smyrna that really hated the, the new Christian, they called it a Christian sect. And the reason they hated it is because it was a rival for Judaism. 
it was a, they viewed it as a rival. The Jews preached one God. Many people in the church were former Jews who had become Christians. They preached one God. They viewed it as a rival to the, to the Jewish faith. And so the Jews instigated a lot of persecution. Now the Jews couldn't carry out the persecution. So what the Jews did was they would blame the Christians for problems and would upset the pagans. They would upset the general population. The Jews would say, oh, that earthquake was because of these Christians. This bad weather is because of these Christians. This bad crop season is because of these Christians. They blamed everything on the Christians and it upset the, the community, general population who then persecuted the Christians. The Jews couldn't do it, so they would upset the pagans, they would upset the general population who would then carry out the persecution. So there was a real problem between the Christians and the Jews, primarily a persecution coming from the Jewish community, and tonight we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about what's right, what's wrong. We're going to talk about gossip and slander. It's, it's going to be really good tonight. You know, Rick, the enemy was just working through the Jews to, to stop the message of Christ. Absolutely. They were trying to stop it. They were trying to stamp it out, and they were using the pagans to do it. Mm -hmm. Verse 8, Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And that's Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Verse 9, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Hmm. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now tonight we're going to stop right there. And I want us to go back to verse 1 where it says, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. And I'm going to read verse to eight, you. Verse 8. Verse 8. I'm going to read to you from page 415. 415. 416. 416. 416. Second column, the very middle of the page. Where it says, These things saith the first and the last. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Mm -hmm. Now listen careful. The words, the first and the last, have definite articles. What does that mean? Now isn't that amazing? That would be a normal question. What does that mean? Why is that important? And I explain. This means Jesus doesn't depict himself merely as a beginning, but it has a definite article. He is the beginning. He's not just a beginning. He is the beginning. Likewise, he's not just an ending. He is the end, <laughs> or he is the last. Wow. Those Powerful. definite articles are very important. Powerful. He is the beginning. He is the ending. Powerful. Isn't that something? Oh. This resounds the triumphant message that Jesus says the beginning, the conclusion, and everything in between. Therefore, he knows the past, the present, and the future. A message that must have meant a great deal to the believers who were undergoing such intense persecution. They would have realized that this means nothing happens that Christ isn't aware of. He knows what has happened. He knows what is happening, mm -hmm. and He knows what will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That is amazing because in, in verse 8 it says that with those definite, definite articles like you just said. But in verse 10, He explains that at the end, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. But I don't want us to go to verse 10 yet. I know, but just that those definite articles give so much meaning to the rest of the text. It really does. Then if you would look at the next page, page 417, the persecution against, second, first full paragraph, the persecution against Christians in Smyrna was so intense that it often resulted in their death. Therefore, Christ's next words in Revelation 2, 8, which was dead and is alive. Now that's very interesting language. The word was, next paragraph, is from the Greek word genomai. <laughs> and you've heard me teach on the word genomai from Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Mm -hmm. So you, just for a moment, just, just for a moment, I was The dead. word genomai means to become. It conveys the idea of an unexpected turn of events. And I've written here, who would have ever imagined that God would become flesh and then submit himself to those who would put him to death? <laughs> Yet this is precisely what God endured when Christ became 
dead. And this word genomai in this particular case means for a brief moment I became dead. I am, what, is, what does it say? These things say at the first and the last, which was dead. I briefly became dead and <laughs> am alive. And if you look on page 418, the very middle, the tense of the word used here it makes the declaration even stronger for it means that Christ is continually alive. Amen. The word alive in the original Greek emphatically means that Jesus Christ lives perpetually, he, continuously, continuously and, forever. and forever. His is an unending, unending life, life that will never, never see death, death again. again. Amen. He visited and conquered death, tasting it once for every man. Amen. Praise the name of Amen. Jesus. Amen. And Jesus said to the Smyrnians in verse 9, I know thy works. Mm -hmm. The word know is the word oida, the same word which we saw in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2, when Christ said to the church of Ephesus, I know thy works. In fact, Christ says it to all seven churches. To Ephesus, he says, I know thy works. To Smyrna, he says, I know thy works. To Pergamum. To Pergamum, I know thy works. What's the next church? Thyatira. Thyatira, I know thy works. Sardis, I know, I know thy works. works. To Philadelphia. Philadelphia, I know thy works. To Laodicea, I know thy works. I know thy works. And to all seven of these churches, the Greek sentence structure is very interesting. It says, I know the works of you. Not I know your works, but I know the works of you. Mm. In other words, I know the works that are particular, particularly true of you. Mm -hmm. Not just I know your works. It's not just a general statement. But I know the works of you. I know the works that you're doing. The word works is the word erga, which means general activity, everything there is to be known about you. Oida, know, means to see with your own eyes, therefore to know by personal observation. So what Christ knows about these churches is not because an angel has told him or mm -hmm. because somebody related it to him in prayer, but we've already seen that Christ has been walking among the seven golden lampstands. Mm -hmm. And Christ has seen this with his own eyes. And now he says to the church of Smyrna, which is suffering, I know thy works. I know the works of you. I know all about you. Everything that is particularly true about you, relevant to you. I know everything. I've seen it. I've observed it with my own eyes. About you. About you. Now he goes on to say, I know thy works and tribulation <clears throat> and poverty. Now, I'm not trying to alter the Bible, but I just want to just give you a little historical fact. In some of the very earliest New Testament manuscripts that exist, there's something different in this verse. It doesn't have, I know thy works. Thy works does not appear in some of the oldest manuscripts. In for Smyrna? For Smyrna. In some of the oldest manuscripts, it says, I know thy tribulation and poverty. Hmm. And if those earlier manuscripts are accurate, it's, re it's really very precious if you think about it because Jesus doesn't review their record. This is a church that is suffering. He would have simply said, I know your tribulation and poverty. He would have gone right to where they were hurting, right to where they were suffering. So whether he said, I know thy works and made a general statement that I've made a review of you and all of your activities or whether that's not there and he simply said, I know your tribulation and poverty. That would just show that Jesus went right to the heart of the problem. Either way, it's a marvelous message. Mm -hmm. Now the word tribulation, I know thy tri your works and your tribulation. This word tribulation is the word thalipsis. And the word thalipsis means to be crushed or to be in a suffocating position. Why don't you comment on this just for a minute and I want to look something up. You know, the suffocating I, you know, I was position. thinking about what Dad just said about, I know that works in, in, in the earlier manuscripts and certain of them, there were, they didn't have that phrase. But either way, God knew their works. Oh, he knew all about them. Yeah, he knew their works. All right, I found what I'm looking for. Page 420. 420. What paragraph? 
Third paragraph, the word tribulation comes from the word thalipsis. This word is so strong that it's impossible to misunderstand the intensity of these difficulties when Jesus talks about their tribulation. It conveys the idea of a heavy pressure situation. As time progressed, this word came to describe any situation, now listen to this, any situation that was crushing or debilitating. The adjectives to describe this word would be acute, awful, critical, dire, dreadful, grave, grim, humiliating, overpowering, pressing, and subduing. All of these would accurately describe the various nuances of the Greek word thalipsis, which here is translated tribulation. So when Jesus said, I know your works and your tribulation, by the way, the Greek says the tribulation of you. Their tribulation, what they were facing, was different than what any of the other churches were facing. And Jesus said, I know the tribulation of you. I know what you're facing. And he goes on to say, and your poverty. This particular word for poverty, reading from page 422. Okay. 422, the second paragraph, second mm -hmm. column, the last paragraph. It must be noted that the Greek text has a definite article before the word poverty, which means it refers to a specific or a unique kind of poverty that was wrecking havoc in the lives of the Smyrnian believers. This word customarily was used to describe a poor person from a lower class who must perform manual labor to make a living. Now, does that mean that all the Christians were uneducated and that's why they were performing manual labor? No. I'll tell you why they were performing manual labor, and that's on the next page, and on the next page, and you can read about it yourself. There were trade guilds. No, they were called kiligia, but they were trade guilds. Sounds like a Russian word. And trade guilds, the, for instance, there was a trade guild for metal workers, there was a trade guild for idol makers. Uh, in Ephesus, do you remember whenever the, all the idol workers came together? That was a collegia. That was, that was a club or that was a trade guild of all the idol workers. Uh, today we have unions. Well, these were like unions. So it's kind of like a colleague. Collegia. Collegia. But it's the, the Greek word, it's the Latin word collegia. Mm -hmm. And to be a member of these, every collegia, every trade guild, had its own God. And so when they came together as a union, as a business union, as a workers union, they always had a festive celebration and they had the worship of their God. These were closed events open to members only. And when I say a festive meal, I'm really talking about an orgy. These were horribly perverted events all around the God that they worshipped, and it was an event to get that God to bless their trade guild, to bless, to bless their particular business union. If you were not a part of that a union, then you couldn't do business in the city. You just couldn't do business in the city. If you weren't part of the club, then you were not, then you were not allowed to do business. You were blacklisted. Well, Christians who had come to Christ could no longer participate in those events. Before they had had high, high earning jobs. They had been very blessed. This was Smyrna. Smyrna was located right on the beach of the Aegean Sea. It was a stopover for people traveling between Ephesus and Pergamum. And there were lots of hotels and restaurants and there was beach business and cruises which came into town. It was a resort city, and there were all kinds of businesses there. But you could not work unless you were a member of a collegia or a trade guild or a union. Hmm. And because in the closed events of the unions, they would worship that union's particular god, and they would have a festive celebration, which was an orgy, it would involve all kinds of sexually perverted activities, Christians had to back out of those unions and they could no longer participate. And because of that, because Christians stood for what they believed, 
and said, we will not commingle with the world. We're not going to do what we used to do just to earn money. They lost their jobs. So when the Bible says, when Christ says, I know your poverty, the word poverty is the Greek word which describes great poverty. Great poverty is the Greek word penia. This is not somebody just poor. This is somebody that is in abject poverty. These believers had lost their incomes. Many of them had lost their homes. And it had driven the church to be closer to each other because they leaned upon each other for support through hard times. But isn't it interesting that Christ knew they lost their jobs? He knew that. He said, I, I know your works. I know the works of you. I know all about your activities. I know about the tribulation of you. I know that your situation is grave. It's very acute. I know about your poverty, he said. And that's not all he said. He said, but thou art rich. The word rich is the Greek word plusias. And the word plusias describes somebody that is exceedingly, exceedingly rich. Hmm. Now, you know, there was a time when I would not have understood that statement. But living in the former Soviet Union, there are some things I've come to learn. Some of the richest people that I know are people who don't have a lot. But they're rich in faith. They're rich in fellowship. When there is persecution, there is a different kind of richness. Believers draw to one another. Believers lean on one another. There is a richness of fellowship. There is a richness of the word. There is a richness of strengthening one another. Jesus said, you are poor physically, materially. You are living in abject poverty, but oh, you are so rich. And not only that, they had eternal riches because they were laying up riches as they served Christ faithfully in the face of persecution. Because Jesus said, great, those who are persecuted for my sake Great, 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 great is your reward in heaven. Isn't that something? And then Jesus says, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. What page is that? Page 428, but it's, it's in your Bible. It's a, it's a Bible verse. Oh, okay, sorry. It's verse number nine. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And I want to talk about this, and I, and I can't do better than just to read right from the book. So it's on page 428, the very bottom. 428. The word blasphemy in this verse must be viewed in its context. It is the Greek word blasphemia, and it does not refer to speaking irreverently about divine matters. Rather, it is a broader meaning that refers, now listen careful, to any type of debasing, derogatory, nasty, shameful, ugly speech or behavior that is intended to humiliate someone else. Wow. That's what blasphemy, blasphemy means. So the Jews were speaking debasing, derogatory, nasty, shameful, ugly speech or behavior deliberately intending to humiliate someone else. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to read to you that it is on page 430, and I'm going to take a few minutes to do this because I think it's so important. Deliberately humiliating somebody else. Ugly speech intended. Here's the thing. You can speak truthful things not intending to humiliate somebody. You can speak the truth without intending to humiliate. But on page 430, in the second paragraph, it must be noted that God commanded the Israelites to treat the Jews, Gentiles, to treat the Gentiles or non-Jews with respect. In addition, the teachings of the Torah prohibited, are, 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 are you seeing this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Speaking ill of someone with the intention of negatively affecting that person's reputation. The Torah forbid it. The Torah forbid making a false accusation against someone that stains his reputation. The Torah forbid it. The Torah forbid publicly humiliating another person. 
All of these behaviors were prohibited according to Jewish teaching and law. To demonstrate why such behavior was considered blasphemous, it is necessary to understand the commandment of the Torah. Vicious slander. Everybody say vicious slander. Vicious Vicious slander. slander. It's called lashon hara. Is a sin which is strictly forbidden by the Torah. And I've quoted Rabbi Joseph Telushkin, one of the leading contemporary scholars of the ethics and commandments of the Torah. And here is what Rabbi Telushkin wrote. We often speak lashon hara, and this is very vicious slander, when we're angry at someone and want to do damage to that person's good name. Understandable as a desire for vengeance may be, Jewish law commands those of us who have a grievance against someone to confront him directly rather than to go about speaking ill of him. Many of us lack the courage to do so. Instead, we take revenge by denigrating the person and thereby thereby diminishing the person's reputation. Isn't that evil? It is evil. Rabbi Telushkin also made this observation regarding the subject. Lashon hara, that is vicious slander, often does incalculable damage to the good name of the person being discussed. Now, now listen, now listen to this. Unlike a physical injury where the full extent of the trauma is usually obvious, Lashon hara is likely to be repeated by those who hear it and they will in turn tell it to others, thereby causing an ever-expanding circle of harm. Even if the speaker eventually regrets the damage he has done to his victim's reputation, it is usually impossible to undo it by getting in touch with all the people who heard the negative report. Vicious slander. It's so evil. If you would jump down two paragraphs. Although we don't know exactly what the Jews in Smyrna were saying about believers, we do know that the Jewish community contributed significantly to the intense hatred that rose against Christians in that city. It is therefore logical to conclude that the Jews in Smyrna were involved in verbally dehumanizing Christians, thereby committing blasphemy against them. In other words, the Jewish community aggressively attempted to publicly embarrass, humiliate, denigrate, and lower the status of believers in Smyrna by attacking their character. In this sense, the Jews committed blasphemy as they deliberately spread half-truths, trumped-up charges, lies, slander, and accusations about believers in an attempt to sway the opinions of both the government and society against Christians. This evil, malicious gossip, and the spreading of lies can be devastating in its effects not only to the individual, but to entire groups of people. Now, this is, this is so interesting to me. As Rabbi Telushkin wrote, the difference between those who slander individuals and those who slander groups is that in the case of groups, the victims can number in the tens and hundreds of thousands. Such was the case for the Smyrnian believers. By the time of John's vision on the Isle of Patmos, the rumors of the Jewish community had circulated about believers in Smyrna had already done incalculable damage to the local Christian community. Like a blazing fire raging out of control, stories about Christians had swept through both the pagan and the Jewish communities, causing widespread panic, and Christians were blamed for all kinds of things. And as always is the case when referring to people groups, it is certain that not all the Smyrnian Jews participated in this vile behavior. However, the fact remains that the Jewish community was the primary source of vicious attacks that effectively destroyed the reputation of believers in the city. Rabbi Telushkin commented that when slander is directed at a specific group, the damage inflicted can include murder. Telushkin went on to stress that once a slanderous characterization renders a group of people less than human, they become easy to kill. Whether or not the goal of the Jews' slanderous attacks was to render Christians easy to kill is unknown. Nevertheless, it is indisputable that in many cases, murder was the result of these attacks. One thing is clear. The Jews intended to permanently stain the reputation of Christians and thereby lower their status in the community. Isn't that amazing? 
And then if you would jump to the other column. No account demonstrates this evil behavior better than the historical record of Polycarp, the elderly leader of the Smyrnian church whose death was largely instigated by the local Jewish community. Harboring deep hatred against Christians, certain Jewish leaders helped start a riot that led to Polycarp's arrest and ultimately to his martyrdom in the stadium of Smyrna. When hatred consumes people's hearts, they act irrationally, even to the extent of violating the principles they hold to be holy and true. For example, we know that according to the official record of Polycarp's death, that the Jewish population joined with the pagans to cry out for Polycarp's arrest. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. And this is called Lashon Hara in the, in Torah. the Torah. And it's forbidden. It's absolutely forbidden. Maliciously, intentionally denigrating another person and staining their reputation. And one thing I really like that he says is that vicious slander is more dangerous than a physical injury. Because a physical injury you can see, you can treat it, you can even recover from it. But when slander is spoken, it is ever increasingly passed to another group, another group, another group, another group, another group, another group, another group. And in fact, one document says that slander, Denise, I want you to look at me while I tell you this. The slander is character assassination. And every time slander is told, that person is assassinated. It's like you've murdered that person over and over and over and over and over and over by repeating something, repeating something. You know, this really talks about the, the horribleness of gossip. Um, yeah, uh, and the need for our character you, you to not have this in it. That, that we slander or gossip or criticize others intending to harm them. You know, oh, let's let me tell you this one little thing I heard about so-and-so. This is, this is blas blasphemy according to the scripture. Uh, you, you referenced on page uh, 430, Leviticus 19.34, and I opened it, where it says, Do not exploit the foreigners who live in your land. They should be treated like everyone else and you must love them as you love yourself. Remember that you were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. Hmm. I, the Lord, am your God. Wow. It's a command of, stru of Scripture. Mm -hmm. But let's continue in Revelation 2, verse 9. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy. Now, we've talked about the blasphemy. This is deliberately injurious speech. The blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. And I have written... The words they say could be translated, they assert or claim or profess to be Jews. Now, what page are you on, Rick? 433. Okay. Second paragraph. Jesus says, they say they are Jews and are not. Do you see that? Mm hmm And I've written in the second paragraph, all those, these people were Jewish by birth. Their blasphemous behavior didn't coincide with the teachings of the Torah. In fact, their behavior was so offensive to Christ that he called them the synagogue of Satan. Although they were of Jewish origin, they were not worthy of the name. That, that spirit of bitter opposition was indeed manifest often in the treatment of Christians. I just, I just think it's amazing. If it's a synagogue, it had to be a, Jesus says a synagogue of Satan. It had to be a, a, a group of people. A, a, a. It was the Jewish community. It's talking about the Jewish community. Hmm. Then if you would go to 435. Okay. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now that is a very powerful statement. Now why would Jesus say they are of the synagogue of Satan? And I have written, and it's true, we can only imagine how offensive it would have been meant for the members of the Jewish community in Smyrna to hear that Jesus called them the synagogue of Satan. I mean, that's very, that's, that's very offensive speech. The Hebrew word Satan is derived from the Hebrew verb meaning to oppose. When it is used with a definite article, it refers to an actual literal being and not merely to a metaphorical personification of evil. The verb form of the word also means to accuse. 
indicating that Satan is the one who accuses and slanders those whom he opposes. The Greek word for Satan is satana, which denotes an adversary, an antagonist, or a wicked opponent. But in the New Testament it always refers to a spiritual being that stands in opposition to God, <clears throat> namely the devil. Jesus' words reveal that Satan operated in the synagogues of Smyrna, causing them to become a breeding ground for adversaries of Christianity. An antagonistic spirit thrived in these synagogues which were filled with wicked opponents of the gospel. The blasphemous behavior of the Smyrnian Jewish community was so offensive to Christ that he referred to them as the synagogue of Satan, which is to say, in effect, they functioned as a community of accusers. That's really what it means. They functioned as a community of accusers. Their inflammatory indictments against Christians were fueled, or so they claimed, by ardent religious devotion. But in reality, this particular group's malicious fervor against believers spewed from baser motivations made evident by their plundering of believers' materials. You know, that's, that's something that's very interesting, is that they plundered, the Jews were known to rob believers, to physically, to rob them. Then if you would go to page 440, first full paragraph in the left column. Are you enjoying this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We can see from all these scriptural examples that it wasn't uncommon for Satan to find refuge in synagogues throughout the Roman Empire. The enemy tried to use certain Jews in many communities to oppose the gospel. But Revelation 2.9 makes it very clear that the persecution and opposition instigated by certain Jews in Smyrna was especially intense. These hostile Jews created such a malignant and destructive atmosphere for the newly emerging church that Jesus unapologetically declared they were the synagogue of Satan. Satan, a gathering of Jews among whom Satan fostered strife, lies, gossip, hatred, and even murder. Jesus implied that great numbers of the Smyrnian Jewish community were swept into this anti-Christian fervor and caught up in the pandemonium that ensued against believers. The synagogue, a meeting place originally intended to be a house of God, had in fact become a habitation for Satan. Any comments? It's a lot, a lot said in two verses. Isn't that something? It's, 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 a lot, it's a lot said in two verses. Then in verse 10, Jesus says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. One thing I love about this is Jesus doesn't say, Wish it away, pray it away, confess it away. I believe in the power of confession. But Jesus is the beginning. He is the end. Not a beginning, not a end. He is the beginning, he is the end. He is the alpha, he is the omega. He's everything in between. He knows what has been, he knows what is, he knows what will be. And Jesus speaks to these believers and he tells them the truth. He wants to alert them to the truth of what they are about to face. Everything that they have faced up until now is just a precursor to what they are about to experience. So Jesus says to them in verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Jesus almost says it like it's a promise. He's telling them, you're going to suffer. And he goes on to say, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation. How long? Ten days. What in the world does that mean? I don't know. What does that mean you have tribulation ten days? Be faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. You know, I think that must be pretty important. You're going to have tribulation for 10 days. And so I think we're going to talk about that in the next home group. You know, Paul, uh, not Paul, John wrote this from the island of Patmos. John wrote this from the Isle of Patmos. I wonder when the, t because they were in Smyrna. Yes. There was a whole sea in between them. I mean, when did this 10 days start? Well, first of all, you have to figure out what the word 10 days means. Mm -hmm. it's obviously, it's symbolic. What does it mean you're going to suffer for 10 days. Because when we come back to next week's home group, I'm going to tell you what it means. That's pretty exciting. 
I also enjoy that Jesus said, he didn't say everything will be okay, it's going to stop. He said, those who, who, who make to the end. Those who overcome. Will have a great reward. And it means that even in the midst of their horrible situation, it was possible for them to be overcomers. They didn't have to be victims. They could be overcomers. And likewise, regardless of what you're facing right now, you don't have to be a victim. You can be an overcomer. Uh, I doubt that anyone listening to me today is facing the intensity that these believers were facing. And if Jesus told them that they could overcome, then Jesus is also telling you and me that we can overcome. We can. We can overcome. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, do you see how this is applicable, applicable to what we're facing in life today? There is so much talk in the community today about Christians. That Christians are bullies. That Christians speak hate language. There's so many things being said about Christians. And we as a group are being denigrated. Well, I, Everything that Christ said to these churches, he's still speaking to the church. That's why Jesus says to him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I these think, messages of Christ then are very relevant today. Joel? I think that in today's world, it seems like everything's okay, everything will go, and you don't need to criticize someone else's way of life. But the truth is the truth. And the truth will set you free. That's what the Bible says. The only problem is not everyone knows they need to be set free. So they're not really looking for the truth. We need the wisdom of God and we need the boldness of God to stand. And the power of the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit. And I, But I was just reading this morning, thinking about it that the Holy Spirit, because he lives inside of us and he lived in these believers, that he was doing the same thing in them that he's doing in us right now, that he's teaching us, that he is there to comfort us, that he is there to guide us, that he is there to show us things that are to come. So the Holy Spirit was doing the very same thing for those believers as he's, as he's doing for us right now. He was comforting them. He was comforting them. His power would come over them and they would pray for each other and God would minister to them, encourage them. That was some of the richness that they had. Oh my goodness. When he says, but you are rich. And Plusia, right? The Plusius. Plusius. Very so, rich. Very rich. Very rich. It's overwhelming riches. Riches. Even riches. though they had lost their jobs, they had no income, they were drawing near to each other in fellowship. They were drawing near to each other in supporting one another. They had riches mm. on a different level. Jesus said, oh, you're so rich. And plus <laughs> they were storing up riches in heaven. Yeah, because Jesus knew that they were probably going to be with him soon. And they were going to receive their eternal reward. Wow. A great reward, it says in Matthew. Well, I think we need to pray. And Denise... I would like for you to lead us in prayer tonight. If you would pray for our home group. Okay. Would you do that? Okay. Joel. Father, we are really humbled by your word and thinking about these precious believers and what they endured. And Lord, we just pray right now. We pray for our home group that we would all stand strong and stand fast and be unmovable in our conviction and be unmovable in our faith in these times and that we will hold to your scriptures. Lord, like it said about Polycarp, that he was one who intensely studied the scriptures, that, Lord, we would make more and more you are priority that if we've lost our first love that we would gain back that early love that we would remember that early love that we would repent and we would do the first works and lord we just thank you that your holy spirit is living in us he is convicting us he is encouraging us your word has power 
to show up the intents of our heart, to di divide asunder the soul and the spirit. It's bringing comfort. It's bringing encouragement. And Lord, we just, we're just grateful. We feel, Lord, that we have feasted upon your word. And we thank you for this, Father. We thank you for this fellowship around your word. Because your word says that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We fellowship with one another. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for the power of your blood. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives and how you're guiding us every day, every day in every situation. And we pray this in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen. 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 I just want to read the scriptures one more time, what we've already covered and what we're going to cover when we come back to home group next week. What we've already covered. Revelation 2, verse 8. And unto the angel... Who is the angel? Uh, Polycarp. Polycarp. So write Polycarp by the word angel. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first, the first and, and the, the last. last. Now remember there's a definite article. Not a first, but the, the first. first. The first and the last. He is what was, what is, what will be, which was dead, temporarily became dead, but now is continuously, perpetually, endlessly alive. alive. I know thy works. I know all about you, about all of your activities. I know about the tribulation of you. I know what you particularly are going through, a debasing, a very acute, grave time. I know about your poverty. It is the deprivation of physical material because they had lost their jobs, because they could no longer be a part of the work clubs. But Jesus said, but you are rich. The word plusius, you are the Greek. I like to say the Greek word really means you're filthy, stinking rich. Yes. They were rich in other ways. Rich, rich, rich. And I know the blasphemy, the denigrating language meant to deliberately humiliate you and to stain your reputation of them which say they are Jews and are not. They were Jews according to birth, but they were not Jews according to behavior. But Jesus said they are the synagogue of Satan, or as we've seen this word Satan means accusers. They had become a community of accusers. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna begin in verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried, and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be thou there faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Mm. And when we come back next week, we're going to cover verse 10 and verse 11. Wow, Rick, I can't wait. Hasn't this been rich? Oh, it's so rich. Well, time's up, and Denise and I and Joel are going to go read the chat. We want to hear what you had to say about tonight's home group, and we're looking forward to your comments. So... We're going to reconnect with you in just a few minutes in another way. And we want you to know that we're praying for you. And you know, if you're a partner with our ministry, we want to say thank you for being a partner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, we ask you to pray about mm -hmm. becoming a partner to help us do our work of ministry in Russia. And through our home group, we touch the world. And so we thank you for that and we ask you to pray about it. But God bless you and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.